Hello, everyone. I'm Eiji Bilik, the founder of Self-Publishing Mastery, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our first July episode, July 2020, for posterity of the Self-Publishing Mastery Talks. And uh, we have a special guest today. Uh, we are going to build a bridge from uh, gloomy California, because it's, it's July, but the June gloom is still here to one of my favorite places on earth, one of my favorite cities, London, because, well, London has a lot to do with self-publishing mastery, with me as a writer, and with my friends and authors and literature and people I love and with the Alliance of Independent Authors. So without much further ado, hello, Sasha Black. Thank you <laughs> for being you. here with us today. But, and thank you for inviting me. It's always an honor and a pleasure, so thank you. So let me tell you that Sasha, if for those who don't know her yet, so she's a woman of many, many talents. So first of all, she's an author. She's also a rebel podcaster, and we are going to talk about that. Um, she's also a developmental editor, and she's also the conference and blog manager for the Alliance of Independent Authors. And that's how we actually... Uh, virtually met <laughs> so far um, because the alliance of independent authors they are doing so many great great things for uh, for authors around the world and uh, they are doing this yearly summits and i was honored to be part of it so uh yeah and i have to to tell that um so she has five obsessions words obviously she's an she's an author expensive shoes uh guilty as charged here as well as curious. yeah self-improvement and breaking the rules so this is going to be a, a very very interesting episode. <laughs> um and she's also a, she's also a mom she she looks like she's a she looks very very young like she's a teenager but she's <laughs> she's a mom she's a mom and you know so she's a mom and she's doing all all this stuff and um, I want. I just want to start by by asking you how how do you find time for uh, for writing with this situation that's happening that's still happening in the UK. I mean, I think people uh, kids are not in school yet. So so how do you cope with everything? Yeah, uh, number one, not so young. Think it's the lighting. <laughs> <laughs> the Definitely. lighting always matters. <laughs> Definitely approaching my mid thirties. Um, but yes, okay. So lockdown, it's been brutal. Um, we are in a situation where um, schools, uh, some schools, schools are open, but only some of the year groups have gone back. Now, I am lucky enough that my son is in one of the year groups that has gone back. Unfortunately, during lockdown, we brought a house, which is just almost an impossibility, but um, it was an empty property and had been empty for six months, so they were allowed to show it. Mm -hmm. So we got to see it and we brought it and we are now moved in. And unfortunately, the new district won't allow him to change schools until September. So I am now stuck <laughs> until September with my son. So it has been, um, uh, I, I can't lie, it has been, unbelievably difficult on so many levels it's difficult for him it's difficult for me it's difficult for my partner it's difficult for us as a family unit because we're all on top of each other mm -hmm. and my son is not he doesn't um like play with himself very well he he loves people he's a huge extrovert and he likes to play with people with friends with adults so he's not super good at entertaining himself so the first three months of lockdown were were savage and i just did what i could a lot of working in the out in the twilight hours mostly in the evenings which was exhausting because i would be parenting all day and when I could work during the day, I would. Um, and then, um, you know, working all evening. So it was, you, you know, I felt like I was getting to the point where I was just working for, for you know, 18 hours a day, be it parenting work or, or, or work work. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I'm not really in a situation where my partner can help. 
So my partner works for an organization and continued working just remotely the whole time and oh. on conference calls all day, phone calls all day, and there just isn't the ability for them to help. Um, but what I would say is to the mums out there who are also business women and who are writers or entrepreneurs, these are exceptional circumstances that this is not normal and therefore you cannot expect a normal productivity mm -hmm. out of mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. you can't expect to deliver on goals all of your goals anyway you can't expect to parent in the same way you can't expect to manage anything in the same way and that's okay because this is a time limited thing this is not going to go on forever i know there's lots of people saying oh you know until the vaccine and blah, blah blah no listen it is not going to go on forever so you know what if your kid has a bit more technology it's okay it's not going to be like this forever and um you know i can't i can't claim to have got it right all the time but um i'm just doing my best and i'm trying not to beat myself up because there is it's so easy as a woman to wrap yourself up in parental guilt and and then and then what are you doing like realistically you're bashing yourself when all you're doing is trying to do your best and 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 it's you know it's rich coming from me because i've definitely gone yeah, i've had some weeks where i've done that um but yeah what you know now we have moved thank goodness my mum is now close so sort of one one day a week um she's taking him and I am just I'm I'm working from the moment my eyes open until I collapse in the evening because that enables me to then be more present when he's around so you know it's just yeah it's managing any which way you can right now is okay it is okay <laughs> but, I mean these are two really empowering messages like first of all not beating yourself up and realizing that's okay that you're doing what what you can the best you can at every moment uh, and then the other thing is this is not going to last forever despite what media tries to make make us believe so these are two really empowering messages and then you mentioned um being a businesswoman and i think that's something that uh women who are writing but then you know men who are watching and uh, are uh, taking the self-publishing route but even the traditional publishing route this is something to consider that we are nowadays more like business people if we are really serious about making an impact in the world with our books and i wanted to to, to discuss that um but uh, before getting into that, I want to mention that when we scheduled this interview, and this was a month ago, that, so this is how disciplined you are with, with, your, uh, with your time, um, you also mentioned, oh, we can, we can do it like after eight because I have dedicated family time every day. And I think this is great because although we are working from home, I think uh, creating this windows of time where we are focusing on one thing and not on, on a million things at a time can definitely help with our productivity it can and it helps with the mindset too and it, it also helps with expectations so my son expects me not to be mm -hmm. working i expect myself to not be working mm -hmm. and you know we also have rules like no technology at the table because mm -hmm. it, you have to have some sacred space away from the media are away mm -hmm. from you know social media are away from work um so yeah it's just it, and look i am not perfect some days you know i replied to you today like, but some days we do but it it's about if you if you don't have those boundaries then everything leaks into everything mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. at least if you have those boundaries and you put them out into the world then most of the time you'll adhere to them yeah yeah, and then I think other people, when you communicate those boundary boundaries really, uh, really clearly, that other people will will respect those. Exactly. And and listening to you, Sasha, I can tell that you are passionate about self improvement because obviously I think um, the tools, the self improvement tools, um, help you make all these decisions and navigate uh, trouble times. Uh, more easily and i think um 
these self-improvement tools. I've, I've been an advocate uh, for a while of actually using them on a regular basis to enhance creativity, to avoid writer's block. So I would like you to elaborate a, a little bit on this topic and, and, uh, and tell us about what self-improvement means to you uh, and how it helps you. So I think there's a couple of levels. The first one is that I am a perpetual student. I will learn until I am either blind with old age or I'm deaf or I can't, you know, I cannot take in any more. Uh, so I will always study. And um, so, so the, the self-improvement is on a variety of levels. Mm -hmm. One, it's, it's for my business. I always try to improve myself on multiple levels, marketing, writing, so the actual craft, business, mindset. They're, they're the four um, mm -hmm. that I try to improve on in my business. But So that's one level of self-improvement. The other level of self-improvement is very much the personal, um, you know, my personal mindset, mental health, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And I always think that we are, you know how they say you are um, the product of the five most uh, mm -hmm. closest people to you? Well, yeah. I think that's also the case of what you're putting into yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you put in trash TV for five hours a day, you're going to be a product of the trash TV. Um, if you put in educational podcasts or marketing podcasts mm -hmm. or you put in um, documentaries or you put in um, non-fiction books you will become a product of that and for me I, I read 50% or I never intentionally do this but when I count at the end of the year I have always over the course of the year read half of non-fiction and half fiction mm -hmm. and I find that they whilst most of the self-help books don't really tell me anything new they are telling me in a different way mm -hmm. and they always reiterate lessons and remind me and and for me they are a beacon of hope they are a a slice of positivity that i can put into my day and usually i'll read you know first thing in the morning or last thing at night and either i start my day with a slice of positivity or i, or I end my day with a slice of positivity and and yeah and i always think you know if i keep putting these things in keep reminding myself eventually you start habitualizing the actions and the habits and the knowledge and yeah like i i never want to stop learning i never want to stop putting that goodness into me because it means i will keep iterating and optimizing my business and i will keep in turn giving that positivity out to other people yeah. So yeah, yeah. So books, books are uh, books are one tool you you're using. Um, any other tools to keep your for your uh, mental and emotional hygiene as a writer? Yeah, audio books always, podcasts also, um, and also interviews like this. So talking to other writers um, and using my podcast as a, as a means and a tool to do that. Um, I honestly think everybody should have a podcast because it's the most effective networking tool I have come across other than in-person conferences. Um, also mastermind groups. Mm -hmm. So I have, um, oh, possibly possibly two or three master I'm trying to count that I'm bound to forget somebody but a couple of mastermind groups that have peers so people who are um in in the industry at a similar level but doing mm -hmm. have different models or whatever and we are there for the good days for each other and the bad days for each other mm -hmm. and you know there's never allowed to be any apologies for for the bad days um but also we you know we will then also brainstorm help people come out of things so i use mastermind groups and also accountability because that helps keep my mindset um focused on producing and delivering so i have um a long-term accountability partner um i have a podcast that's kind of a form of accountability as well um which is a different podcast the rebel podcast um yeah so i would say ah and other than that <sighs> I have a bit of a volatile relationship, but I do try and meditate. I, I, I sort of 
I'll do it for like four months and then I'll fall off the bandwagon and I won't do it for three and then I'll get back on the bandwagon. But yes, I love meditation as well. Yeah, I, I, I hope you would say that <laughs> because I, I love meditation. I, I start my mornings. Uh, it's always part of my, my morning routine and uh, actually included in a program for authors that's called uh, Stress Less, Write More because I think stress is something that can really uh, take a, a really hard hit on our creativity. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, there are, there are, there are uh, a couple of those tools that are really, really effective. And I, I love that you mentioned uh, mastermind groups because this can definitely help and you can see results sooner than if you, if you work all by yourself. And then you mentioned, Absolutely. you mentioned podcasts and I want to now, because you brought that up, <laughs> uh, I want to, to talk about uh, the two podcasts you're involved with. As you said, uh, one is your podcast and of the other one, you're co-hosting it with, um, mm -hmm. with, with another person. You have a male co-host on that one. So um, uh, how did it start and, and uh, why, listen, why our viewers should, should listen to your podcasts? So the Rebel Author podcast is a podcast for any creative with a, I guess, a rebellious, cheeky streak mm -hmm. in them. So it is a naughty podcast in that there are swear words, there, are, there is sarcasm, there's, you know, cheeky jokes. Um, uh, but uh, it's fun and we have a giggle and there's a lot of um, listener engagement. So each week I'll read out a story mm -hmm. um, by one of my listeners about a time they have rebelled. And we have mm -hmm. some wonderful stories from all, all over the world, from all different you know, big rebellions, little rebellions. Um, and yeah, so the purpose of the podcast is to um, help people who want to, you know, write full time, I guess, or have a business, it might not be full time, but have a business in this industry. And I interview people um, who are ex experts in different areas, and also occasionally people from outside the industry as well, but, but who would have lessons that apply to mm -hmm. um, our industry. Um, so the Next Level Authors podcast is much more chilled. It's like two friends having a pint on Friday night, because that's basically what it is. We usually record on a Friday. And also there's a lot of banter. Um, there are, so each week we set ourselves tasks. And if we don't complete those tasks, there's a forfeit. And um, we do the forfeit on air as well. So it's all quite funny. Um, and the, po the purpose of the podcast is to help each other in a form of accountability get to the next level, mm -hmm. um, whatever that may be. And he has a different level that, than, than me and I have a different level than, than him. And we ask each other one question a week with the aim of focusing each other on improving that thing. So, for example, last week we were talking about risk. So what is your relationship to risk and how do you manage risk mm -hmm. in your business? Mm -hmm. The week uh, I can't remember the week before, but we've asked questions like, what is a good publisher? And we've explored what that means to, you know, for each of us. And um, yeah, so we look at an element of business each week and it, we just chat and, you know, we call each other out and yeah, it's fantastic. It's, uh, it's very good fun. Yeah, both, 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 both sound fantastic. So we will, uh, we will put the links in the comment section of the video so people can click on it. And, and I'm, I'm really excited and I'm, I'm looking forward to listening to the next episodes on, on each podcast. And uh, podcasting is pretty, um, I think it's getting uh, bigger. Uh, many, many authors are considering starting a podcast, but I think some of them are kind of scared because they would have to learn a whole new uh, set of skills. Skill set. Mm -hmm. So, um, how was your learning curve, uh, and what helped you navigate that process? Um, I, I, I am not technically brilliant, and I managed to do it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. There is a learning curve, and I and I won't lie about that. But there are ways to make your life mm -hmm. easier. 
-hmm. So if, for example, you choose a podcast host, they will push your podcast out to all of the platforms mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. listen on. And that makes your life a lot easier. I think the biggest lesson I can give anybody is to keep it simple. So I started the Rebel Author Podcast and went in all bells, whistles, and it, it was too much. Mm -hmm. So up until lockdown, I was doing transcripts on everything. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, and though each transcript, although it is transcribed by AI, mm -hmm. um, it took an hour <laughs> to edit to make it you know yeah. seem reasonable. Yeah. Um, I, I, we didn't, when we started the next level of the podcast, I was like, we're not doing that. And I've had to stop them because of lockdown, because I, there just isn't enough time in my working week yeah. and I had to sacrifice things. So, I mean, the technical side of it, the most difficult thing that you have to do with a podcast is to snip bits of audio. So you're mm -hmm. literally looking at a waveform and you're listening to it. You make a mistake and you yeah. almost like cutting out a, a mm -hmm. sentence in word you cut out that bit of audio and that's honestly the hardest part <laughs> of of podcasting um and and but but you know for me that that it wasn't that that was difficult for me it was reaching out to people i was absolutely petrified of pitching people and and for me that's why i wanted to do it because it would it would push me to network and to do things that I'm scared of, like communicating and, and doing an interview with somebody I've never met before. You know, this that's terrifying to me. But yeah, so I think it, don't be scared. Do it. It's fantastic. It is the best networking tool that I have, especially in lockdown. Um, and more than that, you as the interviewer get to learn so yeah. many things from other people. Yeah. Um, and so for no other reason, do it for selfish reasons, <laughs> um, because it's wonderful. Yeah. 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 I agree. And, uh, yeah, same with this video series series that I think it, I will turn, I will turn it into a, into a podcast as well, that just this opportunity to, to connect with, uh, with uh, authors and experts, uh, and, and creative people from all over the world. That's, that's really something that's fantastic. And um, this brings us back to what you were s talking about earlier when we, were, we started our conversation about self-improvement. And you mentioned that there are several areas in your life where you are, um, you are doing the self-improvement stuff. And so one is the writing craft, one is the business, business side. And these are all aspects uh, where uh, the Alliance of Independent Authors uh, finally <laughs> getting to this topic uh, actually helps uh, authors and although this is an organization based in the UK it is open to authors from all over the world yes it is it is and I am very fortunate to um, get to work with Orna who mm -hmm. is the director and the founder at the Alliance of Independent Authors um, and she is just fantastically knowledgeable um, and yeah so the I mean the way I see Ally and this is not with a professional Ally hat on but just as a member of the organization mm -hmm. for me it's like a union Mm -hmm. You know, there's unions for teachers, there's unions for police officers, there's, there's societies for traditionally published authors, but there was nothing for mm -hmm. indie authors. And so in my mind, it's very much um, a union of sorts. Um, but one of the things that I love about Ally is that they also campaign on our behalf. So they will campaign on things like in um, the UK, they just lifted um, VAT on eBooks. And Ally campaigned and lobbied the government and they lobby in other countries too. And they, they will do global um, lobbying campaigns and Orna will speak in different countries on behalf of indie authors. 
and they're constantly trying to improve their offering. So for example, there's now Ethan Ellenberg, who is a literary agent, who is now one of the advisors for Ally, who will advise for members in the organization. So because of Ally, you can have access to a literary agent. Mm -hmm. And for example, I just did a, I'm in the process of doing a collaboration. And so I sent the contract to the to Ethan as a literary agent, as a member, not as part of the team, but as a member and was like, hey, can you check this out? And he did, um, you know, and that's aside from all of the juicy discounts that you get <laughs> by being part of a member. I mean, for me alone, the ally discount that I get with Ingram Spark pays for the membership itself. Um, you know, you only have to upload two books a year and it's already paid for itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and then all of the learning. So every Monday we have these huge, great, big 5,000 word blog posts that are in depth on a topic in the industry. We have, um, a podcast, which, you know, tries to go across all of the different aspects yeah. of publishing. Um, and we also have the conference, which is twice a year. And mm -hmm. that is, 24 hours of content over 24 hours um and we always have phenomenal guests um guest speakers with you know who are at the top of the industry um yeah like people like mark lefave um we've had book Bub, we've had joanna penn mark dawson um i think you had jane friedman right Yep, Jane Friedman yeah, is have, yeah. yeah, we've had her a couple of times. Yeah. Um I'm just yeah. trying to think I mean literally you Angela Ackerman, another one. Um yeah, you name it, they have been yeah. in the conference. So it is it is yeah. a fantastic conference. Lawrence O'Brien for uh, from Books that Books Go Social. So yeah, it's it was for me it was an honor to be in such a such an outstanding company and it's always a, I'm always looking forward to to, to the to the to your summit and uh, Hopefully we will be able to meet in person maybe next year at the London Book Fair because I know now you have a a, a day is it a, I think it is you kind of are doing something in in connection to the London Book Fair every year. I I don't know what Ally will do next year, mm -hmm. but previously they have definitely done that. And yeah. whatever they do do next year, um, they always have a party in the evening. That much I know they always <laughs> have. But I think what they do each year changes depending on what campaigns they've got or um, yeah, what they've got on. But there are always members of the Alliance at London Book Fair. Um, and they've got like a indie author HQ that's put on by London Book Fair. And that's basically where all of the indie authors congregate. And the wonderful thing about London Book Fair is that you have people like Mark Dawson, yes. like Michael Andale, um, yes. like Joanna, just mingling. And, and, and that's what makes, I, I just love the indie community and the fact that everybody's so down to earth and they just hang out there. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, you know, I remember back in 2015, that was my last time at the London Book Fair for now. Uh, that's when I, uh, I, uh, I discovered Mark Dawson and he was um, not, I mean, he was already doing really well and my jaw dropped when he said, oh, you know, I'm a self-published author and last year my earnings were about half a million dollars and I was, wow, that's fantastic. So he, he was really, his story was so inspiring. So this is one of the people in the industry I, I, um, I keep following, and uh, I love your 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 um, your newsletter, uh, the Ally one. Yeah, the yeah the uh, the Ally one. It's it's full of so many um, so many useful insights, and uh, it is a great read, and, and I recommend it to to everyone. So so yeah, there is a lot of good stuff coming from from Ally, and. Uh, Again, I will put the uh, the link to the website in the comments so you can go and check the, the membership options and uh, and check the blog and um, stay up to date with the with the next summit that will be in in the uh, in the fall. Uh, oh, is it September October? It might be October. Yeah. So uh, so there is there is a good time really for us to be. Uh, to be uh, independent authors nowadays because uh, now we have all these um, tools available um, and then organizations like 
ally and uh, on top of that apparently people are reading more and and uh, uh, book sales especially ebook sales are are, uh, are soaring all over the world so um, a lot of things are happening that can bring us joy absolutely i couldn't agree more so you're an author sasha we haven't we we haven't talked uh, much about it um and i guess this explains i mean your passion for words <laughs> explains that <laughs> um i'd like to know more about your 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 books and your writing process and what are you doing to to connect with readers Oh, so many questions. Okay, so I write both um, fantasy and I write nonfiction. Um, so my fantasy, I've published um, some young adult fantasy and probably next year I'll be moving into adult fantasy. Um, and my nonfiction is writing craft books to help writers develop their craft. And they are very much in the ethos and tone <laughs> Uh, of my podcast, which is cheeky, sweary, rebellious, sarcastic. They're meant to be humorous writing guides. Well, um, we need that, right? I mean, we, we, ha we have had enough of traditional uh, schooling, so we need something that's... Exactly. That's and I don't think that... I, you know, I consume so many craft books and I am so bored of craft books that are dry. Mm -hmm. There's just no need for it. And I think it's the ultimate irony that people would have writing craft books showing you how to write that are really written very boring like mm -hmm. <laughs> why what just makes no sense to me um yes so i write those um in terms of how i connect i have um uh, mailing lists for both of them and i have an extremely engaged facebook group mm -hmm. um for my non-fiction mm -hmm. side uh, which i have been focusing on more than my fiction of late but towards the end of that year i'm going to be swapping that around but um yeah so i do a lot of lives so live q and a's um i try to always what's the word um foster uh, like two-way communication so that's why i include listener rebel li listener rebellions on the podcast because mm -hmm. i like to get people to engage um we have accountability in my facebook group as well so a month um, a weekly thread in there and everybody posts what they're going to do each week and we get hundreds of comments every week um, yeah, so I do the Q and A's. What else do I do to connect? Um, I'm very active on Instagram as well. And I will always do like random Q and A's. So mm -hmm. if people want to ask questions, I'll just, you know, dedicate an hour and answer loads of questions about writing, marketing or publishing. Um, and then, I mean, and then all of the usual, usual channels like advertising just to get people through the door. Mm -hmm um but yes i try i try to make myself available as much as i can without doing a detriment to my writing time um and i try to give back as much as i can so i'll, I'll that's another thing i do i run um uh, irregular but i run a session a writing sprint session called mm -hmm. poison and prose um and in my facebook group usually on a Wednesday, sometimes with a guest, um, we will, I will go live and everybody will have a poison and it could be gin, it could be chocolate, it could be nachos, <laughs> it could be whatever, it could be fruit if that's what you choose your poison to be. Um, and then we write prose and we do writing sprints and then I will do question and answer sessions between the sprints. Um, yeah, so I just, I try to, I try to engage and to, I'll run polls, things like that as well. Um, but yeah, I just try and be there for people and be helpful and to give back. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that tends to foster highly engaged groups, I think. Uh, I can see the editor in that, in that, uh, in what you just mentioned earlier, where you give people, like, where you choose the poison and then people have to write. And I want to touch base, base on that as well, um, on that, uh, uh, that skill of yours being a developmental editor. But first of all, uh, so basically you have two different targets because that's a problem that uh, I face because I write fiction, but I write, I write nonfiction as well. 
And then I do these kind of things where I talk about book marketing. So basically I have probably three different audiences, but you as a writer, you have two different audiences. So you have uh, people like me who are authors and want to become to improve my you know marketing craft and then you have the the readers so how do you um separate pre separate and present yourself in the world i mean your public persona not yeah. to, so you you won't confuse people okay so it's it's really it's it's difficult and also very simple. So mm -hmm. I am simplifying it somewhat because the way that I have it set up currently is, is more complicated than I'd like. So the biggest thing that I do is I keep my mailing lists separate. Mm -hmm. So I have a separate fiction list and a separate nonfiction list. Um, mostly I try to promote my fiction through Instagram, but I have there is a bit of a bleed because there are a lot of the bookstagram community who are also usually young adult readers are also um, um, aspiring authors. Yeah. So there is bleed and I am noticing that um, the more nonfiction I sell craft books, the more of my fiction I'm selling without advertising the fiction. So I know that there is a crossover. Mm -hmm. um, and I try to, I would say that it is much easier for me to engage with writers and my nonfiction audience on a one-to-one -one or one-to-many level mm -hmm. than it is with my readers, so my young adult readers. Yeah. So for me personally, most of that engagement comes through um, the mailing list and advertising. So I tend to pick up a lot of my readers for fiction through advertising and the only engagement that I get other than through Instagram follows and the odd comment there is through my mailing list and and that's okay I just they are different audiences with different needs yes. and for a long time I thought oh you know I need to be providing the same level of engagement and actually I don't think I do there are some genres who you know, they, they just want to read the books and don't necessarily want to engage with the yeah. authors. And I think particularly for my young adult genre, that is a split. So for example, the younger young adults, um, to the true young adults, become super fans and they do want to engage mm -hmm. and they want to go to um, uh, festivals and, and see authors speaking. Whereas there's a whole um, group of, well, me, middle-aged women who are still reading young adult books and they don't care so much. They just want to read the books. Um, yeah, so in terms of the branding and, and me, that is why I am changing things slightly. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I made a mistake in that I wrote young adult because I love to read it and I wrote something that I thought was to market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which wasn't necessarily what I wanted to write. So going forward, I'm moving into adult fantasy mm -hmm. because I can keep my three values, which I'll mention in a minute, in, in the style and it will be much more natural, mm -hmm. whereas I had to cultivate yeah. the voice for young adult. So I, my, my three values that I put into my nonfiction and my sort of nonfiction persona are being motivational, knowledgeable and rebellious. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that rebellious side that I want to put into my fiction. And I, I can't really with the young adult or not in the way that I would like to. So yes, that is why I'm moving away from that and moving into adult fiction. I've got two series planned and I think that will help somewhat with not, they will never be the same audiences, but just being a bit more of a holistic brand. Mm -hmm. I, lo I love it. Uh, I love, I love the, your three values. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and you will be, uh, you will be, you will still be Sasha Black because I know yes. Jana Penn. So she, when she does her fiction, she does JF Penn, but then when she does her book marketing and uh, she, she, she's doing Jana Penn. So this is another option for you to consider, not for you, but for those yeah. who are watching. Yeah. But I, I think, yeah, like then handling two different brands, two different names, I think that, that, that would take more time. 
It would. And that's exactly why I am moving more towards adult fantasy mm -hmm. because it, when you split by genre like that, it's two, essentially two completely different businesses, which requires, and each business is a full-time job. Yeah. And I just can't, I just cannot do that. So I'm, yeah, I'm trying to bring everything under one brand. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and me too. And I think I think that that can be one of one of the secrets of 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 actually pulling it off is just uh, finding these core values that stand at at the as a foundation to everything you're doing, and then you can kind of build around those values and deliver different products. I think that that can be that can be an option. Absolutely, and um, and even down to the sentence level and allowing it to influence your prose mm -hmm. you know i i with the rebellious side in my non-fiction like i said i put swear words in or i'll i'll allow my i'll allow tangential whimsical mm -hmm. you know sarcastic sentences mm -hmm. in there whereas somebody who is trying to you know might have professional knowledgeable and um educational as their values might not do that so it's once you have your values you can then allow that to influence mm -hmm. your word choices mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. um you know and that's that is how you truly then embody your brand yeah and, and and being authentic, I think people can feel it right right away that that you're being authentic, and then they they will be drawn to to the real you and to who you are. Exactly. So you, but you are you are a writer, and, and then you are an editor too. Do you still um, so? Um, how does it work when you? How does it work? How do you switch roles with your books? Um. So. Uh... Okay, so with my personal books, yeah, yeah, um, I would say it's been slightly detrimental mm -hmm. to my um, own writing, only in that it slowed me down. So it's been obviously extremely positive for the quality of my books, but it's been detrimental in that um, I have to try and separate the critical which can be quite overwhelming when you're then an editor as well. Um, and I also have my own editor, so I won't edit my books to publication. I will always have a separate editor. And I also have, um, so, so my process, I, I essentially write the book. I write out of order. It's very annoying. I can't <laughs> help it. <laughs> I always write out of order, even my nonfiction, which is even more infuriating. Um, but yes, so I will write Higgledy Piggledy and then I will puzzle piece the mm -hmm, book together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I will then give it to my critique partner who who I've worked with for many many years and I only allow that one person to look at my book and I will then take on board or not their feedback and mostly I do I, there's very rare occasion that I don't take on the feedback and then once I've done those edits I then give it to an editor to like polish essentially do the, the proofing and the grammar and stuff but yeah so for my editing i um yeah um, I, so i'm completely what was the question i've forgotten the question what sorry uh, how, what was the question? how does it how does it work being a being an editor and a writer how how do you balance that in your work yeah so it's really it's also difficult um there are times i won't take on clients and there are times that i will take on clients so if for example i am deep in drafting that's a good time to take on a client because um the editing brain is a different brain to the drafting brain if i'm editing my work i don't like to then take on clients because it's too draining yeah. um if i'm in launch phase um i also don't take on clients but that's usually just because of time mm -hmm. um so yes i will i often get booked up as well so i'm trying these days to do slightly less of it just because it's very time intensive and yeah. i do very intensive edits i'm yeah. a very intensive detailed editor and not everybody likes that to be honest with you but um yes that is what drove me to write um my latest book which is the anatomy of prose mm -hmm. um but yeah and i also i don't know if you've got you've heard of it but um fictionary so i recently did their editing course as well which was fantastic so if anybody wants to be an editor that's a good course to take um 
yes but yeah so it, it it's very difficult and I do have to schedule the editing in uh, when is a good time for um, for an author to start working with a developmental editor like like you like you when they feel like they have taken the book as far as they possibly can um, I would say make sure you've had some kind of feedback from beta readers who are writers. Mm -hmm. So the, the reader feedback comes later. I, I know that that's a controversial statement. Some people would say, oh, you should only have reader feedback, but I completely disagree. Mm -hmm. I think you have to have writers who are, you know, to give you feedback first. Mm -hmm. So you've drafted, you've edited yourself, you've had some beta feedback from other writers, you've done their edits when you are fannying around with commas and changing the odd words and you feel like you can't see any other areas for development mm -hmm. or for you to change and edit that's a good time to get a second opinion um what i would also say is that if you have a good developmental editor getting your feedback back is going to be a shock um <laughs> And if it's not a shock, you've probably not got a good enough editor. Um, and, but the thing is, um, I still remember the first time I got my feedback back, I was gutted. But you know what? I was so much better afterwards. And this is the purpose of a developmental edit. It is to help you improve. And I also think not just your story, but you as a writer, mm -hmm. lots of editors won't give you um the, the the teaching whereas i do and that's why i'm slightly more expensive and why uh, you know mine are slightly more in depth because i not only pick up where you have something for consideration i always can call it consideration or, or thought because it's not up to me to edit your book that's your decision it's your mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. but i also give people the why Mm -hmm. why should you consider changing this why should you look at this and um and that's what the anatomy of prose does the book it, it essentially gives you a developmental edit that is the purpose of the book it, it shows you all these literary tools the mistakes you can make and why you should um why you should consider changing them so i will in that book i'll give for example three examples this is um, what happens when you just you do you filter for example this mm -hmm. is what your writing looks like when you filter this is what your writing looks like when you don't filter you know which one do you prefer and the answer is usually the one without mistake <laughs> oh yeah yeah oh <laughs> but yeah um so you, like your editor should be giving you the the reason why something mm -hmm. needs to change mm -hmm. as well not just you need to change this to this or you know without that explanation i think when looking for an editor, that's something I always look for. Is the editor going to teach me something as well? And it's, you know, oh, I have had editors argue until they're blue in the face that that's not their job to teach you. But I think it is. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And, uh, and uh, I, can't, I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> so I think we can where we can find it it's on amazon it should it's on everywhere. amazon everywhere okay yeah 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 i publish wide so on all the stores mm -hmm. um yeah you should i think even for paperbacks it's everywhere book depository all the, all of the usual barnes and noble places like that um yes and depending so i have a i have one on crafting better villains one mm -hmm. on crafting better heroes and then one on the anatomy of prose so depending on where you are in your in your writing journey it depends on which one you might want to read and and I, i'd like to mention also that people who uh, visit your website they can they get a really nice free gift if they join your your mailing list i saw that yeah so um I, I funny enough I'm actually just about to change that but it will be something similar anyway um but yeah at the moment I think it's like a 17 page cheat sheet to help yeah. you develop your mm -hmm. villain your villain yes. um yeah it probably will be something villainous but I, I'm so I created that when I published my first book and obviously I've now published three more uh, two more since then um so on the non-fiction side anyway so um I just want to give something a bit more holistic 
Um, but yes, there will always be a lovely cheat sheet or guide or freebie or whatever. Yeah, yeah, to help people. And we thank you for that, Sasha. <laughs> uh, so what's next? Uh, any new books, any new uh, online courses, events coming up this summer? Yes, so I am um, in the process of finishing my first course, which is um, a companion course to the Anatomy of Prose. Um, I'm literally, I'm probably, I'm probably about halfway through all the slide decks and the scripting, and I've got a couple of weeks to get that finished, and then I will have my background back, uh, <laughs> because I just moved house, so I'm in a very echoey, empty office at the moment. Um, but yes, my, my, all my background and stuff will be going up, so then I will be recording, and I hope to launch that end of August, early September, I think. And I will probably do more courses after that. They will always be craft courses. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'll venture into the business side. I'm, I might, I might. But at the moment, at least I'll be doing that. And then also recording the audiobook. So August, I have an audio booth being built in here, which is very exciting. So I'll be recording my own nonfiction. Um, and then... I will also be then going back to the fiction to finish my young adult series and so I can move into the adult fantasy. Wow, it looks like a, a busy and exciting summer and we have to do another interview when you have your background yeah. <laughs> all set and then we can discuss audiobooks and, uh, and uh, more, more of your fiction books and I'm sure uh, and your online courses. So um, there is so much to, to talk about and so much to learn. But, but for now... Thank you so much, Sasha, for, for being with us today. Um, and, Thank you uh, for having me. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure talking to you.